back. And we're moving into our second conversation for today as we are joined by uh, two persons who are going to be telling us more about the creation of the NGO directory and some of the uh, additional resources that are now available uh, through the Belize Network of NGOs. We have with us, of course, uh, the senator representing the Belize Network of NGOs, Osmani Salas. And we have Carolyn Trent Sandiford, who is the president and executive director of the Belize Association of Planners. Good morning, Good morning. and thank you for thank you. being with us. Good morning. Morning, Carolyn. Good morning, Marlene, and good morning, Gavin. And it's always a pleasure to be an open your eyes first thing in the morning. That's right. This is how we start our morning, right? And we're trying to get all the information we can out of you guys. So I know we're going to be talking a bit about the work you'll be doing um, in getting NGOs up to speed. But just before we do, um, I, I wanted to get Senator Salas to, to talk just a bit about uh, the major milestone of the collaboration between the unions and the network of NGOs um, that you and the private sector um, that you recently joined on to. So can I get you to uh, kind of summarize that initiative there? Sure, Marlene. Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I must say that um, this joint declaration that we signed had been in the making from February of this year. Yeah. Um, we had a series of meetings with three social partners, the NTUCB, the BCCI, and the Belize Network of NGOs, you know, working towards uh, developing a joint declaration for reform of essential oversight mechanisms to strengthen the, demo the democratic governance of Belize. So we were pretty close to wrapping up that declaration in March and then COVID hit and that kind of put everything on the wayside for a while. But thankfully we were able to bring that back and, uh, and we signed this agreement Friday, last Friday. So what that does really is to commit these three social partners to five, five areas of attention. Uh, one is to engage in an enduring public awareness campaign, sort of centering around the declaration and our commitments, right? But also to bring along and involve students, educators, the churches as well. Um, yeah. So two major commitments we made is to advocate to bring about effective campaign finance and political parties registration laws as urgently as possible. Uh, we're doing this just before the elections in a way or so that the political parties can, can uh, include these recommendations or these targets really into their into their manifestos, to latch on to them and to accept them and to focus on them mm -hmm. as soon as the new administration is in place. Mm -hmm. uh, another very important one, and, and one dear to my heart, is to advocate for electoral reform. In this country, we have two electoral management bodies. And what we are recommending is that we need an independent and well-resourced electoral commission. Yeah. Uh, much like what is in place in Jamaica and has been working well there. Uh, but we, we need to focus on overall you know, reform of the electoral system. Yeah. And the discussion you had just now with your guests on redistricting is a case in point. Mm -hmm. Redistricting is just one component of strengthening the, the electoral system. Yeah. And a lot of the issues that really uh, centered around that, the issue of redistricting, points to the need for reform of the electoral system. Yeah. It goes way beyond redistricting, way beyond re-registration or, or registration, but really is how do we, uh, uh, our system, right, our elections, how do we do that? We have had the first past the post winner takes all system for since our independence. Has that work been working well for Belize? Yes. Uh, if it has not, what, how can it be strengthened? There is nothing that says that we must stay with that forever. Yeah. We can do the, what we feel are the necessary reforms after 
broad-based consultation yeah. to strengthen the way we are governed, to strengthen the way we elect our representatives, um, mm -hmm. um, etc. No? Another important commitment we made is to advocate through civic education, public pressure, and legal recourses to, to, to bring about reforms that will guarantee the true independence of the, of the other oversight institutions. Yeah. So I've mentioned the need to strengthen the role of the electoral management bodies by creating one well-resourced and independent electoral commission. Yeah. But we are also asking that we strengthen the oversight role of the Integrity Commission, the Office of the Contractor General, the Financial Intelligence Unit, and so on. No, yeah. there is much strengthening that needs to be done. All of these institutions play a yeah. very important role a tremendous role, but there's so much more they can do if they are well resourced and truly independent. And by truly independent, we mean that they are not under the control of gov of of, uh, of a government ministry or agency or any politician. These are very important um, anti-corruption agencies. Yeah. We have good anti-corruption agencies, but they need to be better, you know, better resourced to do the job that yeah. uh, they were set out to do. Well, More time and time, I think we've all said, you know, it, it looks great on paper, but how is it actually enforced? You know, uh, Senator Salas, just to, to follow up with one question there, because, you know, this is a powerhouse of organizations. You're talking about uh, the workers' union, um, all the workers. You're talking about uh, all the non-governmental organizations uh, from whatever mandate they have from environment to social support and development to environment. And then you're also talking about uh, the private sector. Now, signing this declaration is one thing, saying that you all have a common goal. But what action comes along with it? Are you simply foreseeing that you will be uh, a watchdog of sorts? Or are you hoping to apply pressure in any way to get some of these um, these actions executed. Yeah, but yes, yes, Marlene, indeed, it's a tremendous achievement to have these three social partner organizations uh, agree on this on this joint declaration. Yeah, um, it, 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 that in itself is very newsworthy because there are there are probably some areas where all three social partner organizations may not necessarily completely agree and, yeah. and, and, and discussion, but on these, we completely agree. So um, this is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. we, we have a series of meetings um, that we will have to develop our action plan because we will, we will determine exactly what specific actions we need to take, what each, the role of each social partner um, organization in this, and, and really lay out a timetable that will guide us as we, as we go along. So we do have um, the development of an action plan on the way. And yeah. uh, th this, wh what this pandemic has done on a, you know, on a positive side is that it, it, um, it, it has facilitated discussion via a platform like this, Zoom, right? Yeah. So we, we, we actually engage uh, quite regularly. Um, so we do have a working committee representatives of each of the three social partner organizations that meet on a regular basis. And, and okay. now our objective is to develop this, is to finalize this action plan because we have been working on one already. And as I mentioned, determine exactly what role each organization mm -hmm. will play and by when we should do that. Um, we have a, 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 a show coming up uh, next week, I believe, on the BCCI's business perspective uh, where we will discuss this in more detail as well. And we look forward, Marlene, to, to, to appear on your show um, uh, with the representatives of the three organizations to delve deeper into what our plans are. Right. But uh, we really wanted to ensure that we, that we signed and committed to this joint declaration before the elections, yeah. right? So that uh, we can say all political parties um, are, yeah. are advised, are duly advised that um, these are some of the issues that we will be focusing on. I hope we get their attention, and through our appearances on the media, etc., we we want to make sure that it remains in the front burner yeah. of their um, of their of, of their uh, of their commitments going forward. And of course, you can't hold pressure on other people if you don't get your house in order too. 
So this is where this conversation <laughs> is so <laughs> critical. <laughs> Excellent segue. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. I was just about to say that because uh, Marlene, if you may recall, many moons ago, much of what we have been discussing, um, I remember your question in particular saying, but who is going to lead this effort? And if you recall, I kept saying that I believe then and I believe now that civil society represents the best gatekeeper yeah. to yeah. our democracy. And so when we looked at this project, for example, and, and listening to what was, um, Senator Osman is saying, one of the goals of the, the project that we are doing, which is improving the data ecosystem for governance decision making in Belize, is to build a capacity among civil society organizations to promote enhanced governance accountability. And basically, that is what is happening. And so it is, I am so excited when I heard about the declaration because the declaration is speaking to governance accountability. It's talking about public sector management. It's talking about addressing corruption. And it's speaking about three organizations coming together to build critical mass. If there is nothing that politicians understand Marlene Gavina and Senator is critical mass mm -hmm. so I thought this was excellent and um, certainly um, for our project we are pleased to be part of this exciting journey because this project is allowing civil society to step up and to build their capacity to strengthen their capacity to be able to do exactly what um, the senator just spoke about what are some of the um, existing, let's say, problems or inefficiencies that exist um, right now that you feel that you can address by uh, this project? Well, there are a couple things that the project did, but let me speak specifically to what this, um, the, the strengthening of the NGO and mm -hmm. the strengthening of the civil society um, is all about. What the project did was deliver four specific tools that can assist civil society in strengthening their capacity. Um, the tools are an NGO directory, there is an NGO self-assessment tool, there is the open data resources, and there is the NGO readiness tool. And what I'm going to ask Senator to do is that um, if he can speak so if we can start with briefly on the NGO directory, then I can speak on the self-assessment tool and so on and so forth. So Senator, can you speak just briefly on the NGO directory and what is the extent, what do we hope to achieve with that directory? Sure, Carolyn, thank you. Yeah, well, what we're trying to achieve with the NGO directory is to ensure that we have a, a, a listing of all NGOs and civil society organizations uh, in in, uh, in Belize. So the, this is not geared only for, for for registered NGOs or NGOs in good standing, but also to the broader civil society organization community, because we we want to have an idea uh, what what organizations are out there, what work they are doing, what. So, or the geographic area of Belize they're focused in, where their offices are located, um, and, a, and a whole number of other questions. Uh, so if an organization goes to our website, to the, to the directory section, and, <coughs> excuse me, and they see that they are not included in the list, um, then all they would need to do is to click on a link that takes them to what we call the directory intake form and answer a series of questions. Um, the name of the organization, as I said, the district where they're headquartered, the geographic reach of the organization, the, the physical presence of the organization, for example, um, their contact details, uh, the name of their executive director or, or the person who is legally responsible for the organization, a brief description of the organization, the area of interest of the organization. So we ask if the organization is involved in agriculture or children or democracy, education, drug control, indigenous people, human rights, for example. No, and there's a yeah. long list that you can choose from. Yeah. 
And if we missed uh, any, then you select other and indicate the, the, the area of focus of your organization. We also ask very importantly, what is the current registration status of the organization? Yeah. Uh, for an NGO to be not only registered, it took to, for, for, an, for an organization to, to be registered as an NGO, they first need to be registered under the Companies Act. Mm -hmm. And they also need to be registered with the Financial Intelligence Unit um, to, 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 to be in good standing as well, right? So we ask, what is the current registration status of the organization? If, um, mm -hmm. if it's just one of those or neither of those, then as Caroline will explain later, um, another tool of, of, um, uh, uh, that we have in our website guides the organization through the registration process. It is a one-stop shop really to get all the forms that you need and it really it, you know, it guides you along. Unlike now where you have to be going through the web or making calls, you know, trying so it's to simplifying figure out the process. It, it really does. Yeah. Uh, but we also exactly. ask exactly. an idea of what partners the organization works with. Yeah. And um, and their budget, get an idea of their budget. So, so that that really, the more organizations that sign on to this directory, mm -hmm. the better idea we have about the NGO civil so uh, and society organization landscape, how that is set out across the country. Is that a tremendous tool? And yeah. as, as the Attorney General's Ministry has told us, it will help them as well. It will it will help us to help them. Um, and I think we would um, uh, have, this, this will, yeah. will be a tremendous resource to have, not only for us, but for any member of the public who would want to have an idea about the NGO landscape and what particular NGOs may be doing. And, you know, from the outside looking in, I think it's easy to understand why an NGO directory, like a phone directory, can help you. You know, yes. I can find <laughs> the services I need. Um, and if I'm another NGO, I know who I can collaborate with if I want to work on a project exactly. together. But from the that, inside... That's excellent, um, Marlene. That's an excellent point because oftentimes I can use our example from um, our relationship with RTI. Um, mm -hmm. they, wa they were looking at the landscape to do work in Belize based on the areas of research that they do. And that's Research um, Triangle Institute International, who is our partner in this project. And so they linked up with the Belize Association based on the data that we have. So this directory really is a great tool to strengthen partnerships, to establish new partnerships based on the area of work that you want to do. So that's a very yeah. excellent point. And so, perhaps if I can go and just a briefly mention the second tool since yeah. Senator introduced it. Is the NGO readiness tool because Senator has already spoken about the tool. So uh, basically, I just wanted to add as well that oftentimes, uh, Marlene, you made the point of simplification. Oftentimes, and we get it a lot at the association, people would ask, What is the process? And then it comes off as a very complicated mm -hmm. process because you have to go to different agencies to become engaged. But, it, but um, also, it can be a costly process because you then, for many people, they are advised, go to an attorney because you may need the attorney to develop your articles of association and your memorandum of association and the instruments that they need to register. What we have also done is to create templates on this NGO, um, in, in this NGO readiness tool so that if you want to, to register as an NGO under the Companies Act, you and it's, you say, okay, well, we have not registered, it links you to the tools that you need to, to register, including um, examples of templates. Mm -hmm. So it, kind of, it also minimizes the cost, and this is where we speak to strengthening yeah. NGO and, um, and capacity, because yeah. oftentimes people are prohibited from becoming a formal institution because of the cost that it entails to bring in an attorney um, to do some of this work. And so the more organizations can have access to this, these kinds of tools, the more equipped they can be to strengthen their work and do, to do much more. We yeah. continue to point out that NGO is in reality filling a major gap in Belize in a lot of areas, whether it's environment, whether it's humanitarian, human rights, education, this, uh, persons with diverse ability, 
and so on and so forth. So that particular is the second tool that we have created and we are saying to the uh, many um, organizations who are working informally, you now have a resource that you can go through and that is what this is why it's called the readiness tool yeah. because it takes you through the process to see where you are and the things that you have to do to become formally registered. Yeah. Most many organizations who partner um, Marlene and Gavin will tell you they want to partner with an organization that is registered, mm -hmm. not one that is unregistered. So this is an excellent tool. And, and then we have two other tools, which is the NGO self-assessment and the open data resources. So Senator, if you can speak to the NGO self-assessment. Sure, um, I, I think Gavin uh, was about to ask yeah. a question. Oh, um, well, I don't know if, 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 if I should ask it after. I was just going to um, ask sort of um, what sort of, let's say, f expressions of interest or feedback you've gotten from perhaps the NGO community um, that um, are interested in, in, in programs or resources like this um, that, you know, or, or what, if any, has that, um, you know, expression of interest been like so far? Yeah, no, it's, it started to get a steam. Um, as Carlin can tell you, there have been two governance summits um, that the Belize Association of Planners has coordinated and has carried out along with RTI International. We have done, as BNN, we have done a couple of forums with our members and we use every opportunity to, uh, to advertise these tools. And we, have, we find out that every time we do that, there's a flurry of new entrants, right? So. Um, I, you are putting up some of the flyers, e-flyers on the screen just now. Uh, these will help us to get the word out. Um, uh, our admin officer at Belize Network of NGOs will play a key role in getting the word out to ensure that uh, we have as many organizations signing on and using the tools as possible. Yeah. So on the, on the assessment, the assessment tool is a, is a critical one. Um, it, 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 Right, even pre-COVID, but probably even more pronounced now as a result of the crisis, um, this tool offers organization an opportunity to, to do a comprehensive self-assessment of their capacity, okay. where, what, what their capacity are right now in about nine, in, in nine thematic areas, leadership and board engagement, human capital and management, programs and services, how they go about doing measurement and evaluation of their work, uh, organizational culture and norms, accountability and strategic planning, uh, partnerships, financial management, and communication. So the assessment um, actually asks a series of questions for each of these nine thematic areas, and um, you you answer, right, right? Based on your answer, it sort of reports, it produces a report at the end, and the organization will then have a good sense of how well they're doing, yeah. where their weaknesses are, what their strengths are, uh, you know, where they may need to improve. So it gives you like a report card of the capacity of your organization. Um, so, so rather than having to hire a consultant to do this for you, you along with your core team and your board can come together and, and, and complete this, this assessment form that is readily available online on our website. I'm so it's a tremendous tool, and I, as I said. No? Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that because I, I, I keep on thinking about the cost. You know, the NGOs, whether registered or not, um, are probably working already. And there's some, what I hear from you is that you, you've clearly considered those who may be two, three member or, or three staff organization with volunteers. Um, Anybody who's worked in the NGO sector knows that oftentimes when you think of funding, you don't want to spend it anywhere else other than executing your program. So if it's yes, food hampers absolutely. or clothes or um, whatever it is, you want to put your money there. You don't want to be paying a consultant yeah. or a lawyer. You want to optimize your, the use of your resources. Yeah. Yes. So, but does this absolutely. eliminate all the cost though? So I'm already thinking, you know, mm -hmm. I... I I'll go on this site, I'll do the self-assessment. I know I need to get everything in order. Um, what about the actual cost of being able to register um, and, and how do you guide uh, the smaller NGOs especially in being able to follow through on the process? 
Well, certainly, um, 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 certainly the cost, there will always be a cost because, you know, the government will collect it, its fees. Um, so there will be a cost. However, the cost is reduced significantly. For example, more than likely, you will be making a payment of anywhere between 2005 to say 3005 to an attorney to um, prepare your documents. And then you would add another $580 to do your registration. So you're eliminating that attorney fee, which would be like 2005 to 3005 mm -hmm. So automatically, that is a major savings, automatically. But you will still, of course, have to meet the government's, um, government's fee. So it, but at the end of the day, we always believe as well that if the organization is serious about its work and serious about its mandate, then the organization also has to have an input into the cost of doing things. Yeah. And so that cost, as you have seen, has moved from, say, about $4,000 to about $600. That's okay. significant, Marlene. Yeah. But in terms of operations, Marlene, it, 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 um, it offers you some guidance as to where you might want to to, to have a sort of strategic investment for your organization. For yes. example, if the assessment points out that the organization may be weak in, in strategic planning, for example, um, a decision could be to update or to develop the organization's strategic plan. In a case like that, you might want to bring in uh, an outside consultant. Uh, by outside, I mean outside of yes. the organization mm -hmm. to facilitate the strategic planning process for you. And, and, and there are ways to keep those costs down, as we at BNN have you yes. know have found out uh, yeah. we have very limited resources so we we, <laughs> we have to depend on we, we we find out that there are many people out there who believe in the work that we do same goes for our member ngos who would consider very reasonable packages to assist the organization yes. in its development process now. so that covers the first c which Absolutely. is cost let me ask the other c uh, competition <laughs> We know that NGOs oftentimes compete for similar um, for funds from similar agencies or from the same agencies, and often uh, can be very territorial about the work that they do. Um, yes. And we've seen it in in duplication of of you know this. Let me give an example of I give hams to this one, and another organization gives hams to somebody else to to be safe. Nobody's yes. giving away hams except politicians. Mm -hmm. But it's competitive. It's competitive. So. How do you know that people are going to be comfortable disclosing um, this information uh, for the network? Because you said being able to talk about what your budget is, where you're getting your funding from. How do you know that people are going to be able to overcome the competitiveness uh, that does exist between NGOs? That's a, that's a very good question, Marlene. In, in relation to the assessment, it is only the NGO will get the results of that. That will not be for public view. It will be up to the NGO to decide whether they want to share that uh, with the other network members or, or the public. So that is meant to be an internal self-assessment tool to guide the organization along. In terms of the budget, uh, we only ask them to to, um, to indicate a range, right? Okay. A range. So we're not asking about specifics. Just a range, but that in itself is very helpful to us in that we get a sense of, 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 the, of the help that we are providing, of the services, the value of the services that we are providing for yes. this country. That's why um, um, the, 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 the more the directory is built up, the better uh, a sense we will get of how much services we are providing to our, to our wonderful country believes, right? That, that's, that's uh, as I've said uh, a couple of times on the show before, yeah. that's, that's one of the key roles of NGOs, to fill gaps. Gaps yes. uh, uh, right. the, the government are, is not able to fill. So um, we hope that over time we will get a better sense of, of, uh, of the value of the services that we are providing to Belize. Okay. And also I think, um, Osmani, as well, the, as you mentioned earlier, your joint, your joint um, venture with the BCCI and the BNTU, it also gives a sense of numbers because the BNTU can talk about their membership, the, the um, BCCI can talk about their membership, but now the, BN, the NGO network can also start talking about their membership, both in terms of their mass, the, the numbers, but also in terms of the value, as you mentioned, 
Because in a time of challenges, for example, when we have issues, let us say foreign exchange issues, a lot of the funding for NGOs come from externally. And yeah. so we add to the foreign exchange um, um, pot, if I can put it that way. Yeah. So I think those things are very important. And I think one of the last tools that I just want to mention, because I know time is running out, <laughs> is our open data sources. Um, as, um, you spoke earlier, Marlene, about costs. Mm -hmm. Um, acquisition of data um, also has a cost, but it, it has a cost both in terms of what you may have to pay, but it also has a cost in terms of the time it takes to access data, particularly from a culture within the system that tends to hoard information. Yeah. Um, the idea of the open data source is like a library that um, NGOs and civil society and they're the one can access because it's public. And what it does, it provides a range of resources and a range of tools and software programs that one can access that are free, they're open, that one can access and one can use. Much of the, the, the um, entries into the library looks at things, for example, we prepared a number of policy briefs during this um, project. We looked at gender violence, crime and violence. We look at biodiversity. Um, spatial data tools and many other um, many other thematic areas yeah. so in in the event individuals or organizations want to have access to data know where data is whether it's at the statistical institute the central bank and it's just, just about the national data source and inventory it's also so what data can you access regionally yeah. and globally that is free free it doesn't cost you um, for you to access, and it doesn't. It has software programs which are free, or they may be at a minimal cost that you can access and use. Because one of the key um, areas um, in terms of the work of NGO is writing grants yeah. and justifying these grants and the work that you have to do. And in order for your project to have strength and for you to share what the need of your project is and why you need to do this project. You need to support that with evidence. And this is where the open, source, open data for resources come in because you can access data that you can use to strengthen the work that you do. And so these are some of the tools, as um, we have said, we have put together. And we're hopeful, um, we're very optimistic that the NGO community, the civil society community, as well as Belizeans at large, because it's a public place, it's that. Even though we say NGO directory, NGO <laughs> self-assessment, it doesn't stop any organization or person from accessing these resources yeah. because they are free. All they have to do is to visit the www.belizengo.org slash NGO resources, and they can access this data. One of the areas I wanted to quickly mention as well, when you spoke about cost and competition, um, Marlene yes. um, and Gavin, what it does do as well is that part of the assessment tool, there is a, a component, as Senator mentioned, that speaks to partnership. And it asks a quite interesting question, are you in competition? Because there are so many areas that you can collaborate on. And I think the role of the BNN in moving forward is to strengthen that collaboration between organizations. For example, if several organizations does this assessment tool and identify that they may be weak in areas of strategic planning or in partnership and networking, then the BNN can be a center hub which collaborates and coordinates capacity building along specific thematic areas to create that um, sense of collaboration and yeah. coordination between NGOs. So that in itself is a great um, opportunity for collaboration and for str and, um, in terms of building the capacity of the community. Yeah, and, and we know um, funders also look for uh, collaboration between networks as well. Exactly, So exactly. The tool is now active. People can log on and they can uh, do their self-assessment. They can figure out what next step has to be taken. How long is this going to be open for? Indefinitely, Marlene, okay. it would be a debt to have this on indefinitely. 
Okay. Uh, As we I, I don't so it will be in your community one organization at a time. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I, right, very quickly, Marlene, I just want to take this opportunity to give a huge thanks to RTI International and Belize Association of Planners for supporting this initiative. Uh, a big kudos to Carlin for reaching out to me and, and to the BNN and say, let's work together. We have been looking for this kind of support for a couple of years. So when we were approached, we were, we were excited. And of course, the U.S. Embassy's currency program. Without that funding, this would not have been possible. So thank you to, to all of you. All right. Well, thank it, you it all. It has really been our pleasure to, to be a part of this project. Ourselves, we must thank RTI for reaching out to us as well, and of course, to the U.S. Embassy. And when uh, just a very quickly to mention, as Manny mentioned, that we reached out, it's because of the work we do. We do a lot of work on the ground in communities, and we see the role, the strong role, the critical role that NGOs play in delivering a service to communities. And so this collaboration really strengthened our work as well, and for that, we are thankful. All right. Well, thank you both for telling us all about it, and best of luck. And of course, stay safe. With that, you we're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we're going to be joined by the Belize Police Department as we talk about highway safety tips. That's coming up in